Let's talk, let's go a little bit on to DevOps. And I'm going to have a session later on, uh, on DevOps as well. So I'm just going to touch it lightly here. Um, the objective of DevOps, and I, and I will go out on a limb and say, though it's not on the exam, and I know it's not on the exam because it's not part of the objectives that we have to, that we talk about when we coach about the exam. Um, but you definitely need this as an architect. You definitely need this as an architect. Um, you need to understand what DevOps is. And I would, um, one, of the, one of the next classes that I want to put on is a similar type of, an, of, a, of a show for DevOps, right? Getting you um, deep into, into DevOps. But for now, I want you to understand DevOps is about getting the entire organization to commit to one agenda. That agenda may be something like deliver a product that our users love, right? So it's not about, I did my job, now it's your problem. It's not about, they, they didn't do a good job, so now I have to cover for them. That's not DevOps. That's the way we always do things all the time anyway. That's not, I got to wait for a, uh, for a 72 hour SLA before I can get something out of this other department because they have their own agenda, right? It's about everybody having the same agenda that is deliver a, a great product that our, cust that our users love, right? You change the mindset of the organization. And there's a lot of things that we use to do that. You know, it's, it's a people, a cultural change to do that. Um, there's also a lot of processes that can be automated and put into place. Um, to streamline that. So as an example, that 72-hour SLA, why is it there? It's there because there's a whole bunch of things that that group has to do, and they can't get it on the schedule. But how can we make that process not be 72 hours? DevOps is about asking the question of what if. What, if we, what would we have to do in order to get that 72-hour SLA down to be zero seconds, fully automated? What would it take to do that? And then build it, right? So maybe it's got to do this check, and it's got to do that check, and it's got to do the other check. And, um, and then we can fully automate the process so that you don't have to wait anything, anytime at all, because there's test scripts that are running behind the scenes to make sure that all the things that we're going to check for in those manual processes are done or are scripted. How many engineers do you think Azure has, Microsoft has running Azure, that's going around and doing all this stuff for us whenever we click on, say, add a virtual machine? How many engineers does it take behind the scenes to do that? Zero, 100% automated, right? We don't have engineers going around doing stuff. DevOps is about making all that stuff happen automatically, okay? And tools. Tools give us, there's a ton of tools out there already. So DevOps is about learning what those tools are, introducing those tools to our environment. Tools like VSTS, uh, Visual Studio Team Foundation, um, uh, services. Um, uh, change his name a lot. I'm not sure if that's exactly right. Uh, anyway, it's about having the right tools to do that automation and to streamline processes. And uh, once we do that, once we get all of those three pieces working together, and I'm not saying this is something we're going to do in a weekend. Certainly not something we're not something we're going to do in a week either. This is a long process um, to get through. And DevOps is, from an architect standpoint, you have to drive those discussions. Think about who in the organization would normally drive those discussions. Is it the CEO? Maybe he's read about it and he might kick something off. CIO, maybe he's read something and might want to kick something off. But how much does he really know about it, right? They don't have the time to go deep into this and understand uh, what these technologies are. They do have a lot of people banging on their door saying, hey, let me help you with DevOps. So they're learning a little bit about it. Um, is it the infrastructure guy? Is it the developer? No, it's none of those guys. Who is it? It's you guys. It's the architects. It's the people that can think outside the box. And we'll go a little bit deeper in that in a few minutes. Monolithic traditional versus microservices born in the cloud. Uh, real quickly, um, I'm almost out of time. So I, I want to I talk about, so containers are what's next, right? Containers are what's next. Um, but what's next after that? I'll tell you, containers have already been out for years. Um, and containers are already being used. How many people in this room are using containers? Okay. Uh, and online, you can ch raise your hands, too, um, and let the uh, tenant count. Um, not a lot in this room, okay? Um, but it's, a, it's relatively new. Microservices is what's after containers, okay? It's the next leg. And this is what I want to talk about Microsoft. Obviously, this is asteroids. For those that have been around you know, as long as I have, you know what this means. 
think about this. This is a game where rocks float around, and you have a ship here that shoots, uh, shoots bullets or stuff at the, at the rocks, and they break up into smaller rocks, and you get points and stuff like that. In a monolithic or traditional application, that's one executable. Everything just happens inside of one, one executable. In a microservices type of environment, each one of those rocks is a microservice. What a microservice is, is a tiny application that has one job and does it really well. So this, this rock's job is to float into space until it hits something. When it hits something, it destroys, it, it updates the counter base. You know, you got 10 points because I was a 10-point rock. So it updates the counter. It sends a message to update the counter, and it kills itself because I no longer exist. So it flakes off, and you see the particles disappear. If you're a bigger rock, then before you, uh, you're going to update the counter. You're going to, um, before you break up into smaller rocks, though, um, actually, that's the next thing. You're going to break up into smaller rocks, OK? By doing that, what are you doing, though? You're spinning up a whole bunch of services. You're spinning up a bunch of those smaller rock services, and those are all running in the background. Think about the size of the footprint on your screen here. Right? That's asteroids monolithic. When we talk about asteroids as a microservice, think about infinity, right? having tens of thousands of users playing the same game. How is that different from being able to play it now by yourself where you're floating through the screen? Right? It adds. Um, a whole bunch of excitement, it adds the capability of adding a whole bunch of excitement around that. One last thing. Whenever I change the code for this rock, for this, say I'm going to change the code for the big rock to make it green instead of white like everybody else, OK? What do I have to do? I have to update that one little service, that one little micro service to change the, change the color. Do I have to test all these other micro services? They haven't been touched, right? So there's a very small set of uh, things that you need to, to test for whenever you're deploying a microservice. Even better yet, can I deploy that while this game is running live? Yes. Will it do anything? No. But what if I do the same thing? What if I, what if I make the smaller rock um, blue? Can I deploy that while that game is live and has 1,000 people on it? Yes, absolutely. What will happen? What will I see? When the larger rocks spawn off those new smaller rocks, they'll be the new color. You're literally you're updating it real time. So um, microservices is really a born in the cloud. Think, uh, think about doing it very, very, very efficiently and, and breaking down your process into very small, standalone types of processes. There is a wrapper that kind of holds all this stuff together that, uh, that adds a little bit, uh, adds a fair amount of complexity. But that's kind of the future, right? What I want to articulate with you here is there, there's just a ton of stuff for, for you to learn. And an architect's job is to understand what the latest technology is available for you to do your job. Okay? And, um, and you've got a, a long way to go. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, whenever somebody wants to build a bridge, do they start with a blank piece of paper and say, oh, I've got to figure out everything? No, they look at the technology of bridges that came before them. right? Oh, you know, we have the, um, the suspension bridge, a brand new technology that came out whenever it was 40 years ago. Right? Nobody else had ever done it. Maybe it was longer than that, whatever it was. Um, and now we know how to do that because somebody else has already done it. Right? So you're leveraging the technology of the past to make better decisions and better choices today. That's what architecting is all about. Defining an architect. An architect is a person who designs and in many cases also supervises construction. Um, the devisor, maker, or creator of anything, you know, the architects of the Constitution of the United States is an example. It's not necessarily somebody that has to build the bridge or something. It's something that's building something or building a, even building a process. Um, the verb for it is to plan, organize, or structure as an architect. The house is well architected. How does this relate to software? Well, the systems are well architected. Well architected for a house means it's stable. It's going um, to handle the winds. It's going to handle the weather. It's going to handle. Uh, it's going to stand up to to the test of time. You have to decide how long you want that test of time to be. In some cases, you want it to be 100 years. In other cases, you're OK with 30 years. right? And a lot of that is going to be dependent on budget and stuff. In our world, it's about uh, defining um, where, all of that, where all of that stuff lies, where all those parameters are, uh, where are, uh, you know, how long do we want it to run, how fast do we want to be able to restore, um, how resilient do we want our systems to be. 
what do we want? Uh, what do we want to make sure is going to happen uh, in the case of uh, of disaster? All of that counts into it. Um, but you know, as we've talked about some of the other uh, technologies, uh, I want to share this with you. Um, the from an architect standpoint, why do the architect need to know all of this detail? So you think about an architect, a, you know, a, a bridge architect, are they the ones that also need to know how to weld? Well, no. We're not asking you to learn how to weld. We're asking you to understand everything that's involved with the process so that you can respond to things that go wrong. So in the example of a bridge, right, if you have uh, cracks in the seams or it's starting to bow or whatever, you're having problems with it, you're not going to call the welder, you're going to call the architect. Say, uh, what happened? Why did it happen? How are we going to fix it? Right? It's not the welder that's called, it's the architect. So we have to understand this, not only for the systems that we design today, but for the systems that we support forever. Right? So the architect job is a much, much, much bigger job than most people think about. Our job, in fact, is to be given a challenge. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define that given challenge a little bit later. Um, and then create a solution. I would actually go one step further and say, not only are we given a challenge, but why don't we come up with the challenges? Why don't we see those challenges for ourselves and not wait on somebody else to tell us what's wrong? And I'll give you some examples of that later, too. Uh, 2016, last year, CIO priorities and challenges by, put out by Gartner. Um, talent was their number one gap. So they, they went down and defined further about, okay, in the talent, where, where are the biggest um, gaps? Top, top few, look at those, information analytics. How do I take information and analyze it and then be able to respond to that data that we have, right? Um, business knowledge or acumen. Do I understand the business, what the business needs? That's what that means, right? Security and risk. Security and risk. Are the things that we, we're doing, are they the right things? Are we taking on the right risks? Are we spending the appropriate amount of money for the risk that we're able to accept? You know, are we building a high availability system that's always on and fails over to the cloud in 30 seconds when it's really okay if that's down for five days? So it's much more than looking at it from, from, a, from, a, um, from an executor position. It's really more of a strategic, uh, strategic position. This is what CIOs need, right? This session, I'm going to coach you a little bit about that as well as we talk a little bit more about, um, a little bit more about DevOps. And really what I want you to get out of this is understanding what's possible with the, cat, with the cloud and um, how the cloud can help close that, close that gap. How, as you learn about the cloud, you can close that gap. So our objectives, to translate business objectives into actions. First, identify, identify the problem. That's the architect's job, identify the problem. Again, this is stuff that's not on the exam, right? This is stuff that you need as an architect to do your job, to really understand, to really dive in, and to be a pr productive piece of your organization. Uh, identify the problem. This is, what's, this is one of the hardest tasks, because what do most people identify? Nope. They, they define a solution, you're right, they define a, but what are they defining the solution for? The perceived problem, right? So you're putting a Band-Aid on something when they never really understood what the root cause, what the root problem was, right? And you, you, you agree? Okay. Um, and determine the requirements to solve that problem or each of those problems, right? What do we need the solution to be? Um, determine the technology to be able to help solve that problem. What technologies already exist that can help me solve that problem? In the terms of a bridge, we already know about suspension bridge capabilities. We already know about tunneling underwater capabilities. We already know how to do that. We just have to do the research and see how we can use that technology in our business. Um, identify strategic partners. Lots of people can help us if we need help. Right? Getting partners involved is a good way to do that. Um, those strategic partners could actually be internal or external. If there's other pieces of the business that have that expertise, you want to be able to leverage that as well. So it's identifying those as well. Determine likely barriers, right? Likely barriers. I'm building a bridge, and you know what? There's a, the bridge is over the highway, but right next to that is a river. Whenever I start um, uh, uh, 
building this and the river's only 20 feet away, what's going to happen in five years if, if the river gets wider or if there's a flood? Right? How's that impact me? How's it going to impact me from a building standpoint if we start getting seepage in when we start drilling for um, for you know the overpass that's going to that's going to go right next to the to the river? And if you want an example of this, go to um, uh, Somerset, Massachusetts. This exact scenario is there. Right? These are some of the challenges they had to they had to work through. Um, so you want to determine those likely barriers. In our case, the likely barriers might be um, funding. How do I get the right money? How do I get the right people involved to, 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 find the, to find the money? How do I get the right talent to actually execute, right? Um, there's lots of ways to do that. And as you do more research, you cloud sourcing and uh, consultants and all kinds of different ways that you can get talent, upscaling, uh, upskilling, uh, you know, doing uh, lessons and training like this. Determine additional value, if any. This is really important, and most people don't do it. What it means is, you understand the value of doing the project or you wouldn't, you wouldn't be giving it your brain cycles, right? But who else could benefit from it? You might be working on a project for one department or one group, maybe it's IT or whatever. But what business units could also significantly uh, be greatly impacted in a positive way if we did this? Find out who all those are, because those can be your champions to get through some of the barriers that you've already identified, right? So you've got to do all of those things. And then, most importantly, get started. Get started. Get started now. And I'm going to pause here for a second because I really want to go a little bit deeper on this. Um, our role as an architect is so much deeper and so much broader than any other role in, the, in our businesses. The architect is a fundamental uh, keystone of the organization, or it should be. If it's not, it absolutely should be. And the architect is often the one that is responsible for coming up with the plans to make things better, the ideas to make things better. And just as a point, um, this event that we're attending right here today, I've, let me back up. Over my nine-year career at Microsoft, I've had about um, 14 different scenarios where I have brought projects to Microsoft and had Fundamental change to the way things work. You're a part of the very beginning of my next one, number 15. Actually, this would be number 14, I think. This is the very beginning. So how is this, how is this idea that I, that I approached with Microsoft going to fundamentally change the business? I'll tell you about my very first one was, we, I used to be part of Microsoft Across America. We went out and we talked to thousands of people. Right? Had the little trucks in the parking lot and said, if you want to look at it, you want to see it, you want to touch it, go out and visit the truck. Cost upwards of a million dollars to put on one event, but we were talking to 5,000 people. It was death by PowerPoint. It was great. It was an awesome environment. But how useful was it? How much did they really learn from death by PowerPoint? Right? So my idea was to get workshops going, do hands-on labs. I showed Microsoft how to do it because I've done it for years through my community stuff. I had learned long ago that labs are far better of getting people to understand technology than just death by PowerPoint. Now, all of our events are workshops. It fundamentally changed the way Microsoft delivered content from death by PowerPoint to hands-on labs. That was my first. This is my last, my most recent. Taking that, th some of those concepts that we've been using for years now and our customers are dying for this stuff. They're crying for it. They've been crying for it for years. Why aren't we doing it? Because nobody's come up with the idea to do it. I started this two years ago. This is the first, uh, and I've delivered it twice, once in Boston, once in New York. This is the third time I'm doing the delivery. This is the first time I've actually got corporate funding um, through Tara's group to actually show that it working, show it working in action. Uh, I hope. We are able to deliver this all over the country and all, all around the world. Um, and with uh, Philips technology, we literally can deliver it all over the world um, and scale it. And the advantage to you, our customers, is you get this training for free with expert speakers, right? You're not learning it um, secondhand. You're learning from people that are literally writing the books, okay? And not only that, but we can deliver it in such a way that it's not piecemeal, right? A lot of the stuff that you're, a lot of the training that you're getting today is very piecemeal. 
you know, a blog post here, an email, somebody sent you a link from, from there, or, um, uh, you know, maybe you're doing a podcast or something. It's all piecemeal. This gives you the whole story, or a good part of it anyway. So my moral to that is you should be doing that too. That's your job. There's nobody telling you that's your job. Make it your job. Make it your job and you will excel at your company or whatever's next for you. I can assure you that. Value stream mapping. This is a DevOps technology. The first thing that I do whenever I talk about a customer, when I go into a customer for DevOps, um, I need to understand what your environment looks like. Like this is a case of a pipeline, a development pipeline, where we literally walk through every step of what happens from ideation all the way through to production release, feedback, support, redeployment of patches and all of that stuff. I understand what the process is now, and then I look for bottlenecks. I look for those long SLAs. I look for those things that are re repetitive tasks or, or things that I have to wait. Like in one case, they might, we might be all the way at test before we realize that the authentication that we have built into this is to a local computer account. Well, that's not going to work very well in production when we're rolling out to our customers, right? Why should we be finding that in tests? That should be planned out and automatic happens. And oh, by the way, all these tests should be fully automated, or most of them, as many as we can. Right? That's what DevOps is about, is getting rid of all of those deficiencies in the flow of work. Um, a must-read book. Uh, again, you'll have slides. These slides are available already online on the GitHub repo. Uh, Gene Kim, um, The Phoenix Project, must read. If you want to be an architect, you've got to read this book. Because if you're going to be an architect, DevOps is going to be in your world. If it's not now, it should be very, very, very soon. Okay, So read this book. Uh, he's got some follow-ups. This is just some more information uh, on that. Um, but he's got some additional books that he's read, uh, that he's written. They're also very good. Uh, traditional versus modern DevOps. Uh, I just wanted to point out here very quickly. I'm not going to read through it all. But traditional side, literally months to do things. Modern DevOps, speed of the cloud, right? Happens automatically. Uh, it is a culture of trust versus a culture of blame. Not my problem. SQL, it's the DB, DBA's problem. Um, not my problem, it's the developer's problem. Developers, not my problem. IT, the hardware they're giving us is crap, right? Everybody pointing the finger somewhere else. That's the blame culture, right? DevOps is a culture of trust. You, 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 are, you understand that your job is not only to get it to work, get it working in production, uh, not only to get it working in, in dev and in test, but also that it's going to run flawlessly in production. And it's everybody's job. Um, containerization we talked about already, uh, so I don't need this one. So virtual machines, scale sets, container service, service fabric. I, I want to talk about this quickly um, because. Uh, these, this is a new way of looking at things. This, as an architect, you need to understand this, that you're really looking at, whenever you're talking about the cloud, on-premises, you have ultimate control over everything. You build with an infrastructure mindset. Once you move to the cloud, you're really building on a platform mindset, um, and uh, cost and agility are uh, significantly improved. Okay. A key point here, though, is in traditional system admins usually run everything. In a um, cloud environment, developers are usually managing a lot of it because we've offloaded some of the, uh, m many of the manual processes that are involved here to be fully automated that are just executed by the developer whenever he does a deployment. And we have vetted that process, the people that were, that were doing that have vetted that process to make it automatic. I know what everybody's thinking, Ah, not in my world, Dan. No way that security is going to automatically let something go through. No way that monitoring is just automatically going to be assumed that it's running. I want my operations guys to confirm it. That's a blame culture, right? That's not a culture of trust. That is the wall that we break down as part of DevOps. DevOps is a journey. It's not a task. It's not something that happens in a week or a month or even a quarter. It happens over years, over time. Uh, just like Satya coming in and writing the ship in Microsoft. It took time. You know, we still got a long way to go, but we're on that journey. That's what DevOps is, a journey. A virtual machine is, I'm special. I've got a particular thing that I have to do, and I 
don't really need to worry about anything else that's going on around me. A VM scale set is I got, I've got a virtual machine, and I got a whole bunch of them that are exactly like me because maybe I am, uh, you know, Bing. Well, Bing's not a great example because that's a, offered as a platform service, which is a better way to do it. But I've got a bunch of machines that look exactly the same, a large cluster or many large clusters, a VM scale set. Container service is I got a whole bunch of different applications doing their own thing, a ton of them, um, and I just need a place for them to run, an inexpensive place for them to run. That's containers. Fabric. Fabric, you've heard a little bit about it already. Fabric is awesome. So fast. It has built-in orchestration capabilities, lightning speed. I mean, we're talking about the difference between running on, running your cache on a hard drive versus running your cache on memory. Right, wicked fast. You pay a little premium for that, but a lot of his, a lot of the uh, technology is abstracted, and whenever technology is abstracted, the cost goes down, which is awesome. Um, but um, it's also one of our newest technologies, right? So we've got a ways to go to uh, to, to make some uh, some advancements there, but it's already really good. So as you move across to the, to the right, you're really talking more about a cloud model, and lots of different platforms: Windows, Linux, .NET, Java, Python, PHP, Ruby, etc. Uh, and Microsoft loves Linux. You know, fundamental change that, that uh, Satya Nadella brought into the organization is Microsoft loves Linux. But what I want to talk about here is, you know, Microsoft joined the Linux Foundation as a platinum partner this last year. What does that mean? What does it mean? It means that Microsoft not only is treating Linux as a first-class citizen, but Microsoft is embracing open technology. Who, who benefits from that? Think about it from just an open technology standpoint. Um, PowerShell, one of the most recent things that we put out into open source. I don't know how many of you knew that PowerShell is now fully open source, but it is. What did Microsoft get out of that? Well, um, Microsoft had a team of, I don't know what it was, say 13, 14, 15 people, 18 people, whatever it was, the team of people that created PowerShell. And there's lots of other people within the organization, within the different product groups that have their own PowerShell teams that do their, their PowerShell stuff. Um, but the core, PowerShell core, is a fairly small team. Now that it's open source, they still have that core team that some of those core teams are working on the advanced stuff that the community is not going to do because it's too time consuming or too hard. But some of those people are just doing nothing but monitoring and testing what other developers out in the world are putting together. Oh, I want this feature. I'll add it. Here it is. You vet it and put it right into PowerShell. Now Microsoft has hundreds of developers on PowerShell. Why not? Why not? That's, that's, the, that's the open source model. Microsoft gains tremendously from it. What about our customers? How do they gain from it? Great products, better products, delivered at light speed relative to what it is whenever you have to code it and have, go through an 18-month cycle to actually get it released. Right? Everybody wins. It's a win-win. Um, and not only that, but take a look at what's happening. Um, PowerShell for Linux. PowerShell now runs on Linux. There's a PowerShell for Linux. Okay, um, you actually install it onto Linux, and you can run PowerShell. S -s 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 not as full featured as uh, regular PowerShell, but we're going down that road, and it's all open source, so it's going to be added to very, very quickly. So some huge advantages to that uh, for everybody, not just Microsoft, but for our customers, for the open source community, for everybody. Azure. Azure is like a Visio. When you open it up, you got a blank document. And this is, again, we're really high level, 130,000 feet here, right? Visio, when you open it up, you got a blank document. You got a whole bunch of icons over here. You drag them over there, and they create really cool pictures. You can link them all together and um, create some pretty, I've, I know I've created some amazing Visio diagrams. I know a lot of us out here have too. The difference between Visio and Azure are two things. One, Visio is a little prettier than Azure. Okay, so okay, I, I give in. It's a lot prettier than Azure, but Azure, Azure, whenever you build these diagrams, whenever you build these pictures, you're not building pictures of the systems. You're building the systems. You're building the systems. Think about how powerful that is. Okay, that's that's what Azure is all about. It's being able to design the entire infrastructure and all the things that link to it in the cloud. Tips, tricks, and field experiences. Um, so value of certification. Let's, let's drive into this. I, I really want, 
I know in um, some of you, a lot of you raised your hand that you're definitely going to go out and take the test. And I applaud you for making that decision already. Um, I don't know if it's because the camera's running and you're afraid your boss might see it online or whatever. I don't know. Whatever the case, I still want to go through this because not everybody is convinced. Um, the value of certification, self, career, income, stature, lots of things come with it. Thank you. Um, make the decision. Get started now. And I'm going to teach you a couple of ways that you can, um, that you can help um, make that decision. Recognize your accomplishments. Whenever you finish a chapter in a book, whenever you um, finish a module, you know, if you're going through this particular exam, you finish that first module, celebrate that you finished it. Don't look at, oh, man, that's one out of seven. No. Put a positive spin on it. Celebrate that accomplishment, okay? Um, and celebrate all accomplishments, even the small ones. Oh, I finished this 180-page white paper. Oh, what a drag. I'm glad that's behind me. No, celebrate. Awesome. I've learned so much through this. I hope I can re, um, replay it when needed. Right? It doesn't matter that you're going to forget 80% of it. That 20% is the most important, the 20% that you gad, gathered out of it. But most importantly, you're going to remember that you read that somewhere. So when you need that information, you'll know where to go back to get it. Um, get the family on board. I look at it as just like for writing a book. Um, uh, whenever you want to learn a new technology, whenever you want to upskill, just like writing a book. You've got to be hyper-focused on that. So what I did, um, you guys know I'm writing version 2, or one of the authors on the version 2 of the book as well. And uh, I'm almost halfway through. Uh, almost halfway through. I, 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 I told my son last weekend, hey, I, it looks like I might get my first check in, uh, in the next month or so. So I made a deal with him. I, I was like, his name is Brad. I said, Brad... I'm not going to be able to spend as much time playing because I'm going to start writing a book again. And he remembers we, we did this the first book too. I made the same arrangement with him. And I said, but what I'm going to do is to, um, uh, to compensate you for the pain of me not being there every night to be able to play or play as, you know, for a long time is I'm going to pay you $100. So as I get paid, I'm going to pay you. He's 11 years old. $100 is a lot of money. Okay. So, um, uh, and also what I'll do is I'll, you know, take it out for ice cream. We'll get to that in a minute. And anyway, so I had a, I told him, I was like, I should get my first check in a, in a few weeks or in a month or so. And he's like, wow, that's great. I'm going to get 50 bucks. And we played football like every night. Well, I didn't know in the beginning that I was going to be able to prioritize him. So I set the expectation that, I, that there would be some. And there has been some nights that we have, they actually, I was like, no, I got to be heads down right now because I was in deep thought on something. It's all about prioritization, right? So, yes, I'm prioritizing on the book, and you know what? I, I don't have as much time with him. Well, you know, we're playing for 45 minutes instead of playing for three hours. So there is sacrifice there by the family. But bring your family. Get them involved. Take them out. Whenever you finish a module, take them out for ice cream, right? Let them know that you're working on this certification, that you, you, you want to change your life and be able to do better things for them as you move forward in your career. Get them involved. The opposite of that is the nagging spouse, the nagging kids, right? If you don't do the planning up front, that's what you're going to have. Which would you rather have? What's going to inspire you to get through it? Your family pushing you on or your family dragging you back, right? Get them on board. Excuses. I got to cover this even though I totally don't get it. Okay, maybe I get it a little bit. Excuses are easy. Um, results, however, are forever. You learn this technology, you progress in your career, you learn how to do more with what is up here because you're filling it with more. Uh, amazing things can happen, so just do it. Uh, value of time, what is your time worth? When I was a consultant, my time was $150 an hour. As I got further in my career, it was $250 an hour, $300 an hour. That was the value that I put on my time. If I'm gonna go watch uh, a movie with my son and it's an hour and a half movie, that was gonna cost me 500 bucks. I was willing to pay that because the time with my son was that important. What value do you put on your time? I hope it's not zero. Because it's zero, you're going to be sitting on the couch uh, watching the full last season of your favorite program because it's, the season is going to be kicking off here again soon. Right? It's not a productive use of your time. And you do that whenever you don't value your time. So value your time. Um, practice and experience. There is no substitute. Do the labs. Do the work. You will get the certification. It will be easy. Take the test. Second shot. Right? A lot of times you can get a second shot 
uh, to uh, the first time, you know where your weaknesses are. Focus on that, okay? Um, don't let your mind wander. Hyperfocus. It's hard for us. Just learn to hyperfocus. My mission is to get through this as quickly as possible. Your mission is not to spend the next three months reading really slow. Right? Your mission is to get through it as quickly as possible. You know what? You're going to learn a lot more if you go through it quickly because you're going to be so hyper-focused. You'll learn a lot more. Um, Ultra-focus with intent. You'll learn a lot faster. Your objective. Your objective is to pass the exam. Your objective is not to get the next job. It's to pass the exam. Because you know what? Once you're able to pass the, next, the, the exam, you're going to be better prepared to promote yourself, to, um, uh, to position yourself for what's next. Um, and have that cert certificate that says, hey, I already know this. I'm going to show you that I can do it in my current role. And as, we, as I show you these proofs of what I've been able to bring to the table, I I'd like to be recognized for that. Um, dedicate study time, uh, uh, 30 minutes every day or night. Um, pick a time, make it happen. Right? That's how you get through it, uh, something like this. Or that's how you pick up a new technology. Um, read faster. Don't go back when you're reading. If you find yourself mind wandering because you didn't follow one of the other rules, don't go back. Just keep going. That will be a mental cue that you have to stay intently focused because you're going to miss something because you're not going to go back. Okay? So use some of these tips. Um, I, one final plug, um, itproguru.com slash join. Uh, this is a place where I do events all the time. And whenever I do them in a public forum, I often will record them. Um, I hope in my near future I'll be simulcasting as well. Um, but either way, I do have a way that you can join a list to find out. You will not find out about private invite-only events like this one. I didn't do an announcement for that. And I will not be announcing every two weeks what I'm doing for the next two weeks. Uh, more like you might get a couple emails a year because I'm not great at it. And I wait until I have like, okay, I got, I've got 12 things in the next four months. I better put out, a, I put a, better put out an email, right? So you're not going to get everything. Um, but you'll get most of the stuff that I'm doing, and you'll be able to learn things, things like DevOps, containers, application pipeline, microservices, and, and a whole lot more. They're coming, so just join the list. Um, and I've got some slides in the back of this, TechNet Evaluation Center, TechNet Virtual Labs, uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy. Uh, you'll definitely want to check those out. Great places to get. And by the way, if you feel like we've been over your head a little bit throughout this, uh, this couple days, this is where you want to go. Right? Get out there and hit some of these sites and watch some of these, uh, these videos to get upskilled. Here's some more of them. Uh, Virtual Academy videos, uh, various online training, uh, Visual Studio de Developer Incentives, um, Azure training for AWS professionals. So if you're really strong in AWS already, leverage this to upskill to, uh, to Azure. Um, Microsoft Azure for IT pros, uh, LinkedIn Learning Center, um, and then, of course, Microsoft Learning. Okay, uh, so that wraps up this session. Absolutely. And in fact, our next session starts in five minutes. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off early, if that's okay. Um, so for the camera, for the people that are online, uh, I, I just want to kind of set some, some, some uh, a little bit of ground rules here. Uh, actually, yeah, we don't need a break. The reason we're not going to need a break Um, no, the next, the next one. Yeah. Um, so we, we're not going to need a break, and this is why, because I'm only going to be up here for a few minutes to pitch what we're doing next, um, and then you guys are going to just start working. Okay. So this is actually lab time. So we'll take a break in a couple of minutes whenever we get into lab time. For online, I want you guys to participate as well. For online, uh, I'm going to actually turn the camera off. Uh, I might leave it on just so you can see what we're doing. We'll maybe mute it or something so we're not uh, hindering your process. Um, but the people that are running the event, um, I would like for somebody to grab a cell phone or a camera and go ahead and tape it. Okay? Um, we will not use it publicly. Uh, and if we do want to use it publicly, we will reach out to you directly and get permission um, if we want to do that. So nothing will be released publicly uh, without your explicit permission which you may have to go through legal to get or whatever the case may be, that's, that's fine. We'll deal with that at the time. My expectation is very, very little of this is going to be made public. And again, only after months of negotiations to make that happen. But what I do want to do is I want to have you record um, not the, the prep 
part, but the, what we're going to do next is we're going to prepare for audience speakers. The audience speaker section is one where you get to tell us what you liked, what could be better, most importantly for me, is what you learned. What you learned, how you went from where you were when we started yesterday morning to where you are now, and what was that journey for you? Was it a productive use of your time? Uh, do you feel great? Do you feel more prepared to advance in your career? Do you feel more prepared to tackle the business challenges that you have in your organization today? Those are the kind of things that I'm really interested in. And we only have uh, like 20, 25 minutes or so um, to have speakers. So in each of the three rooms, um, I do want to uh, have, the, uh, have this, all of the sessions taped and they can just email me those, uh, those videos that are produced as part of the presentation. The first uh, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes or so, is just going to be the audience preparing. It could be, uh, you, if you want to create a slide, you can create a slide and we'll present it. If you want to just come up and talk, um, that's fine. Um, if you have some uh, really good tips, maybe you've already taken the exam and you want to share some additional tips that, uh, that you've learned as you study for and as you took and passed the exam, um, or other exams and you feel like it's a good tip, I'm happy to hear those as well. Um, this is really about being able to share with Microsoft and being able to help me, really, but this is really about me being able to help me sell this program to Microsoft so we can run it many more times all around the world and include additional topics like DevOps, like containers, like microservice, all that stuff that I want to do. This is my way of giving Microsoft evidence that we really need to do this. So if you would, think about that, especially the thought leadership lessons that you took from, uh, from today, um, those drill into those and tell me what you thought about those. Were those a waste of time or was that exactly what you needed, right? The technology, we kind of know there was a lot. We know it was fast. We know on, on camera, we were a few times we were off screen, uh, lessons that we learned. Um, these, are, these are all things um, that in the feedback, you will give you a feedback URL at the end of the day on the feedback. Uh, you will, uh, and in fact, right after we do, in fact, we'll do that soon. We'll do that before you guys come up even. So if people want to jet out early, they can. Um, but uh, we'll give you a place uh, in the feedback form where you can write additional notes. Definitely put all that stuff in there because that goes into our blueprint for how to do it better, right? Again, this is the first one that we've formally done. Yeah, I did two more before it, but those were very community type driven. So I leveraged the community to help me drive that. This is the first uh, really kind of first party one that we've driven. So take 15, 20 minutes. Um, how many people think they want to do, in this class, how many people think they want to, want to do that? Wow, only one. Okay, two. Okay, good. Uh, hopefully in the next few minutes, you guys will think about other things that you want to do. Um, on, on location or on the, uh, on the webcast or in the other rooms, if you want to uh, uh, do labs during this, if you don't want to participate, just go ahead and do labs. But please, don't leave yet. Let's give, uh, we've got a bunch more lab time coming up. We also, here in New York, we have a social. Hopefully, uh, we're maybe doing that at other locations as well. And um, the bottom line is, these lessons that the audience is going to be giving us, some of them may be more valuable than the ones that were given by the professionals that are doing this every day. So please stick around for their presentations. If you want to leave early, the time to leave is right after the audience presentations. Okay? So let's take a 15-minute break um, to get that started. Uh, we're going to mute the audio. We'll still be available on the IM to answer questions. And please, if we're doing customer, if we're doing audience speaking slots,